The newest part maybe is just like trying to like judge, like, where is there a fake breakdown and how do I like, you know, add into that? I mean, like, you know, like GFAI, great example right there. Yep. You're pointing right at it. What's going on, guys? Welcome to another episode of the After Hours podcast. Uh, we have our usual gang with us today. We have Joe, Alex, and Harry. But we are actually joined by a very special guest, uh, someone who I've been super interested to talk to over the past couple of years. And I know uh, everyone here is super excited to talk to him as well. Uh, we have Tim Gratani. So, Tim, thank you for coming on. We really appreciate it, man. Thank you guys for inviting me. Cool to be here. Yeah, of course. Great. Yeah, man. Yeah, I, was like gonna, I was gonna ask you to start off. Um, I know you have kids and kids terrify me, dude. I'm 28 years old. My girl wants to get married sometime soon. And obviously the next thing after marriage is to have kids. And I'm really terrified. So I want to kind of ask you what it's like been trading as a father and trying to manage that. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, truth be told, I'm a lot closer to retired now than actively trading. Um, it's kind of evolved into that over the last few years. Um, I, I have two kids, four and two. Um, when I first was born, you know, I started off just taking a few months totally off and adjusting. And then uh, it kind of turned into slowly easing back into full-time trading. Uh, when he was getting old enough, he would like sit on my lap while I was trading during periods of time. And like one of my three monitors would be like kids videos to like keep him entertained. <laughs> and, uh, you know, kind of kept up with doing it that way up until about, um, gosh, it would have been July, 2020, I think. Um, and then around that time we talked about having our second and kind of knew that that'd be a game changer, um, where, you know, then we'd be dealing with two crazy little guys instead. So, um, I, I plan to, you know, totally pretty much step away once our second came along and I was working on some quant algo trading stuff with a coder friend of mine down in Puerto Rico. And I figured maybe I could try to let that take over completely. Um, so since our second came along, um, it's been a lot more like I'm just showing up for the very best stuff, or at least that's my goal. And I'm trying to like kind of stay a little bit plugged in, like, you know, keep an eye on Twitter, see what people are talking about. But uh, unless there's like a huge sector really popping off, uh, I'm trying to just more step away and, and enjoy time with my kids and uh, not so much be as active on the trading side anymore, which has been at first an adjustment. You know, there's, there's a lot of FOMO that kicks in. There's a lot of, you know, feeling bad about missing opportunities. Um, but then you kind of refocus and realize like what's really important. That's, that's absolutely terrifying. <laughs> I think it's yeah. crazy. You're holding your kid and I'm thinking of some stock going like parabolic and you just like, Oh, I got to put you over here now and just dropping them off. I, I mean, that's like, how did you deal with like that kind of in the moment? Like kind of like when you were trading, was there ever a moment where you're like, you almost misfire you did something wrong because you had to kind of deal with your kid on your lap or like had to move him around or um i i don't remember anything specifically that i would have been like oh that was my kid's fault or anything like that <laughs> uh, I mean, my, my wife my wife was a rock star she she did most of the work you know when i was actively trading with my oldest and he was kind of hanging out like she would swoop in and take him away if uh he was getting fussy or things were starting to get a little crazy um i mean I, one thing i will say is that like you know parent fatigue and like sleeping bad at night and all that is like a very real thing and uh our first one especially had really rough nights so there definitely were like some fatigue mistakes that were very avoidable um like uh kodak i don't know if you guys remember when that thing went crazy parabolic yeah. um, <laughs> and there was there was one day where i think it was just a fatigue mistake where i thought i was totally closed out of a short on that after day one and i had five thousand shares open that i didn't know about or maybe it was ten thousand but uh, I didn't I didn't figure it out until like mid morning parabolic the next day and lost six figures on it. Yes. And I was like, okay, well, at least it was just a partial. But my God, like I had never done anything like that before in my career. And uh, I guess the only other thing really that would have ever come into play would have been like just, you know, when you're tired, you make more emotional decisions. Um, so, you know, like getting frustrated, not cutting a loser or taking an impulse trade because I'm like, oh, I'm going to try to trade. But really, I feel like I should be spending time with my kids. So, you know, like stuff like that kind of creeps in, like just weird little mental things. When you're trading alone, at the end of the day, whether you make or lose money, it's pretty much all on you. If you are a lone survivor trader, you feel like, at least me sometimes, I feel like I could just risk abnormally large 
because at the end of the day, I'm only going to hurt myself if, if it doesn't work out the right way. After you had a kid, did you feel like your risk tolerance changed after that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, in, in some ways, yes. Like one, one huge shift for me is like, you know, like I've got the side algo quant stuff going on that still like is trying to do short selling. But like personally, I, you know, I said I show up for the best stuff now mostly. Like I am pretty much not short selling at all. Like I think I've done one short personally in like the last two years. And uh, other than that, like I'm just trying to long because it's much less stressful for me. There's a lot less chance of, you know, screwing up and winding up, you know, not fully covering something and having it go, you know, multiple hundreds of percent against you. Um, so I, I've kind of chosen the path of least resistance in that sense where it's like, okay, let's just play the long side because I know I can do it and I know that it will stress me out less. Um, but, you know, the flip side of that too is that, like, you know, as I did detach a bit, when I do have those days where I choose to show up and try to trade something, I do find myself going larger and attacking it with more size because that like I kind of hit on earlier, there's that bit of me that's like, okay, if I'm going to show up, I want to make it worth it. Well, that's, that's awesome. That, Cause that's, that's something that I always think in the back of my head is I consider myself someone that welcomes risk. I consider myself someone that enjoys it to mm -hmm. an extent. And I guess my fear is that when I have more responsibility in my life, whether it be a wife, kids, more people that depend on me, I feel like maybe I will not be able to overcome the fear of that risk. So it's interesting to say that you actually, you actually go in even larger, and bigger because you know you say you're, if I'm here, I'm just going to do it. I'm going to do it the right way, and that's a great way to think about it. Mm -hmm. Well, and then, I mean, also like, you know, there's always that angle of it where it's like, you know, how much of your net worth is really in your trading accounts or at sure. stake. And, you know, that answer is different for everybody. But, you know, I, I definitely keep that in mind where it's like, OK, if I'm long something and it goes to zero, like, you know, that's my worst case scenario. And I still think about that first, um, you know, before I even enter a trade, like how how bad could this really get? And can I live with that? So speaking of net worth. Just kidding. Uh, no. <laughs> no, what ways outside of the market? Because, you know, that's what everybody knows you for is 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 short selling. Well, in the beginning, longing OTCs and stuff like mm -hmm. that. I mean, the trading tickers was the first DVD I ever watched. And I was like, this is groundbreaking for me. I was like, dude, hell yeah. But then you transitioned into the listed side of things and was mm -hmm. just almost exclusively short. And then you've pretty much been a stock guy for the entire time. What, what do you, what do you, how do you try to diversify or do you outside of stocks, outside of the market? Um, I haven't done a ton of diversification. Um, I mean, we have, we have a rental property. So, I mean, we get a little bit of side income off of that. Um, recently with, you know, the interest rates getting so crazy, started doing like CDs and things like that um, just to get some kind of return on capital. Um, but beyond that, I haven't really branched out too much. Like I never really got into like the whole crypto uh, craze or any of that stuff, um, you know, much to my regret now, but yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah I, I mean, I remember watching that back when Bitcoin was like a thousand, but it's uh, right. like when MG, when it was MGTI and John McAfee, when he was alive was front running all that stuff. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, but yeah, I, I just, I haven't really, I, I guess my form of diversification is, is the algo and automation stuff that I'm trying to accomplish because that is kind of the, like, like let's have a computer fully doing everything for me while I'm away and I don't even have to worry about it. Like that, that to me feels like passive income, even though it's still, you know, tied into the market. So maybe we could kind of uh, touch on that a little bit because I find that stuff kind of fascinating um, and also similarly, I also kind of took that approach to I've been like the last like two, three years, uh, mainly have been going along as well because I've just seen so much risk uh, just going short. Like in the past couple of years, I found it like it's definitely gotten like super, super crowded. So I've been doing a lot of longing as well. But maybe we could talk about the uh, uh, the AI and kind of or sorry, the algo process and kind of like how you've been uh uh, like going about that type of stuff? Like what's your kind of process of like kind of attacking and like getting involved in, in like creating those algorithms and uh, what are kind of, maybe you could briefly touch on like something like your strategy and stuff like that. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's, um, 
I'll, I'll be honest. I thought it was going to be much easier than it is. Um, I, I thought it would be as simple as like trying to plug in rough versions of a few of my strategies and they do fine and like make a little bit on the side. And that's kind of the original goal. Like, let's just, you know, make a little bit of extra money on the side with the algos. And it's kind of slowly involved into this or evolved into this like crazy in-depth thing where I'm like having to get way more granular with it than I ever imagined. Um, just because it is so difficult to, uh, you know, try to filter out the best plays and attack them in the best way. Uh, it started with longs, you know, same thing. Like I didn't really understand if automating short selling would even be possible with the whole locates process and all of that. And uh, I mentioned earlier, I have a, a coder friend down in Puerto Rico and he, uh, he had a background in the coding and automating strategies from crypto actually. And so uh, he's been just a huge asset. Like I could not have done any of this without him just because I don't have any kind of real background in that stuff. So it, it turned into like his role would be put things into code and my role would be try to provide like what should the trading logic of each strategy be? And uh, I mean, we, we've had our ups and downs for sure. Like we really got into the long side of things when the market was at its hottest, when everyone was getting the stimulus checks and uh, made something like $900,000 in January and February of 2021. And, I, and that was like around the time when we first launched it, like maybe a couple months after. And I was like, oh my God, like I'm a genius. I've got this. And oh, uh, rich. That's you know, it's like, <laughs> but, but we had trained the whole thing on like, you know, data from when the market was at its best. And that was the problem because then when things cooled down in March and I was, you know, super distracted, my second son had just been born. I was, I was just kind of like really hands off with it. And I was like, okay, like, sure. You know, the market can't possibly keep going at this pace. Maybe it'll go sideways for a while. Maybe it'll draw down a bit, but like things will stabilize. It'll be okay. And I basically let it bleed off back down to a hundred K and it only took like six months for that to happen. So, um, you know, when the market cooled, it really cooled and it kind of taught me a lesson about like seasonality and like how much, like I hadn't considered that in the markets because it's one of those things i think we kind of recognize as traders like in the moment day to day week to week um and i was trying to do like a one size fits all approach where it's like okay here's a strategy that's just going to cover every market and hopefully it you know is fairly consistent um so then after that i was like okay maybe i should get into short selling and we figured out that we could um automate through das and we could automate the locate process and we could basically get all of that firing completely on its own and um that you know, that was a little bit more consistent and a little bit better. Um, the approach I tried to take with that wasn't so much true to like the way I had traded personally. I was more trying to do like a, take a really wide stop approach and try to have a high win rate. And uh, the problem with that was just that I think I was over optimizing where, you know, I'd be back testing these strategies and maybe tweaking um, my criteria a little bit too much and trying to make it a little bit too pretty. And so uh, we, we go on these, you know, I think it's a problem a lot of traders face in their personal trading where it's like, okay, you've got a couple of weeks where things are pretty consistent. You've got decent gains and then a bad day wipes out that two weeks. And uh, that I think we built back up to about positive 700 or 800 K once we incorporated the short selling. Um, but we kept having those big bloody red days and I got super sick of having to sit through those. Cause those were like, you know, it just, it would put me in like a bad mood, like to see the algo have a negative six figure day. And it's like, oh my God, it's trading so stupid. Would so, you ever sit there and watch what it was doing? Uh, not every day, but a lot of days I would be pretty like, you know, I'd be getting push notifications to my phone if a position was being taken and stuff like that. So I, I knew what was going on and I could tell pretty quickly in the day if something was starting to spiral out of control and take loss after loss after loss. So, uh, I think it was December. I, I shut them down. I basically just shut them all off. And I was like, I need to redesign all of these because they're just not good enough. And uh, that's what I've kind of been up to for the past four months. And uh, I'm just starting to put together new ones and put live new ones actually in this last week where it's totally opposite approach where it's like, okay, now we're really tight on the risk management. Win rate is way down from what it was before, but now risk reward is like way better. So we're going to see how it goes this time. Are there any liquidity constraints with the algo? Like, do you face yourself kind of being stuck in maybe in a liquid stock or oversized in certain stocks or anything like that? Yeah, so that, that is one of the criteria for the play selection that we put in, you know, even before I even really start trying to optimize and make them better. It's like, I, I just like right off the bat, try to cut out anything that's illiquid. 
So we, we say like, okay, it's gotta be trading a certain amount of dollar volume per minute or you know, putting through a certain number of trades per minute. And uh, that's kind of its starting point. Um, but even, even with that, we still have issues with some liquidity stuff, like you mentioned, um, where there's you know, some slippage on the stops. Or I, I think the bigger deal, honestly, is missing entries. You know, like if you if you have one of those stocks that, you know, spikes up and you try to short it on the backside when it's just in its free fall collapse and it never, you know, bounces back up to fill the rest of your position, you know, like missing those wins, especially in something that's supposed to be low win rate, high risk reward, like missing those wins is really painful to the overall results. So, um, so, I, how, do you offset those? Sorry? so how do you offset those situations? You know, when you do all your back testing, most of those mm -hmm. times you're assuming fills you know exactly, I mean? yeah. in a perfect world you're assuming fills but then when you go and deploy it like you're saying you miss those liquidity situations where you're trying to catch it when it's popping and you're adding liquidity versus taking liquidity so did you ever do yeah. any experimentation between that so with the um with the exit side, like stopping out in the slippage, um, what I did for this generation of play um, is that I, 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 in the data, we pulled what was the highest price within five seconds of the stock stopping me out. And we're using that as like, what would the exit be? So that's kind of like the worst case scenario, because if we're firing out a market order, like we're going to fill in five seconds. Um, so we're, we're kind of building it off of a worst case scenario from the start, like, uh, like what's the worst slippage we might take and can we still build a possible strategy or build a, um, uh, lost my word, um, build a profitable strategy, um, you know, even with that worst case slippage factored in. Um, so now I think I'm going to do something similar on the entries uh, just because there, there probably does have to be a little bit of chasing involved with the entries. Um, I don't know if I want to be firing market orders at the entries, you know, chasing a stock going down, but yeah, um, you know, maybe maybe use limit orders to chase a percent or something like that. And uh, again, just you know, when I when I go into the back testing and looking at you know how this is done on the past data, you know, just just factor that in as well. You know, okay, we would have had to chase one percent on the entry. Here's what we would have been if we hadn't filled on our stop for another five seconds after the stop triggered. And does it all still net out to pop to profitable and? Right. Uh, just kind of yeah. hope that's good enough from there. Absolutely. Did it ever freak you out having risk on the table with you kind of not in control? Was it something like, because like I know for me, I'm very much a control freak. So does mm -hmm. it, is it weird for you to like watch this thing trading your money and like your capital and like almost like knowing like whatever happens, happens? Or did it become easier like over time? It, it's pretty easy because um, my, my coder tests things pretty well before we put anything live. So like if, if we're testing something, like it might only be taking 50 share positions initially just to make sure everything fires as expected. Like my biggest fear would be something doesn't stop out that should have stopped out. Like, I mean, you know, like something like, um, like the, the weirdest one actually would have been uh, top on Friday. Um, we, we weren't involved in that, but like that, that did not break high of day until after hours, I want to say. And yeah. um, and it volatility halted five minutes before close, which is normally about when we're closing out a position um, that you know hasn't gotten stopped out. So I, I messaged him on Friday because I was like, okay, like we need to make sure we have something in place for this because like if we wind up in a situation where you know we volatility halt, don't cover, and then there's nothing in place to take it like to close the position after hours, like we could end up in a situation like this. Does the algo work pre and post market like? It can, yeah. It can, it can route to um, like Arca or EdgeX or wherever. Um, you know, any any route you have on your DAS terminal, it can use. So you just have to make sure you're routing to the right place. Um, but but yeah, the biggest fear would just be not not getting out of a trade when it should get out of a trade. And you know, we've been doing it long enough that I kind of trust that we're not going to run into something like that. So, um, so well, as, far as, as far as having risk on the table, just day to day that I'm not in control of, uh, you know, that just kind of comes down to position sizing, just being comfortable with how much we're risking um, per trade. And uh, yeah, I'm pretty detached about it, I'd say. Speaking of those yeah. stop loss situations, um, back when RKDA ran and James and I are really attached to this stock in a very negative way. <laughs> yeah, because I squeezed uh, you guys on <laughs> <laughs> and then, yeah, Harry on the opposite side. But RKDA was a situation where I learned the hard way that certain routes, such as EdgeX and ARCA, 
have limit bans to what they will accept on a stop market order. So for okay. example, if it limits up and then gaps up past that limit band, which I believe and it's, I had to talk to Cobra. I, I talked to Chad at Cobra and I was like, what the f happened, dude? And because it just kept going and it, I mm -hmm. never stopped out and I had to physically like cancel orders and re-enter and they had to do a bunch of research, but it turns out that in that particular time, and I don't know if it's, that's really the case, but whatever it was, was that Arca and EdgeX, where they were routing their stops through, had limitations to how much slippage past your stop loss a market order would fill. And that creeped me the hell out, man. And from there on out, I was tripping balls always to use a market stop in a in one of those cases where I felt like, well, what if this limits up on me or something like that from the short side, obviously. But yeah, that was, I, I don't know if that's anything you've tested or anything you've seen ran through, but that was a weird situation, man. Yeah, we, we had some kind of a uh, similar thing, like going into volatility halts where um, certain routes, you know, if, if you're trying to shoot the order through, like right as it's halting or something they like, it just rejects. And then the algo, like our algo was being too dumb to like realize that the order had rejected. So it thought the order was placed. Um, so we, we worked through that maybe a year ago or so. But yeah, we, we've gone through similar things. Yeah, uh, I just thought that maybe we could uh, start on the, some of the sector plays. Uh, oh, sure. and switch gears into that because we just had AI. And mm -hmm. obviously AI was a pretty big sector craze. So did you trade any kind of AI stocks? I did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was, um, I was around for those. I, I totally missed it back round one in January or February or whenever it was. Yeah. Um, I, I somehow it just totally slipped past me at that time. But, um, this time I, I think it was the first thing that kind of, I caught wind of was, the uh, AI, you know, the stock AI was breaking out Yeah. and that kind of, intrigued me because it was like, okay, maybe this is what will kind of reignite the sector for round two. And this time I want to be there for it. Yeah. Um, so my, my process for that kind of was um, just immediately start researching, you know, what, you know, AI stocks are out there. Um, you know, I put the quotes because, you know, a lot of low float stuff kind of takes advantage of sector crazes. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I kind of just started off going through Finviz and finding, you know, the lowest float ones that were in the same sector. And uh, going over to Dilution Tracker, which is still a huge time saver for me because I don't have to comb through filings then. Yeah. And, you know, what, you know, what could possibly drop an offering on me, what can't. And uh, came up pretty early with uh, the stuff like CXAI, GFAI, uh, BFRG, mm -hmm. uh, a couple others that never really ran too well. Uh, FRGT, I think, was one of them. Um, AIXI. I think that yeah. was a that, that was close to having that like eight dollar breakout, but never really got there. Um, but yes, I mean, I, you know, I kind of like came up with a low float list, and then from there was just kind of looking for ones that weren't too buried in previous resistance from January or February, because um, you know there, there was stuff out there like I wouldn't call it low float, but like S O U N or uh, B B A I. You know, like those things had run back then, but they had run with like, you know, 40, 50, 100 million volume days, I think. And yeah, yeah, there was 100 million there on SOUN. So like stuff like that, it was like, OK, yeah, that might rebound a bit, but I don't expect that to have some big, crazy move. And like I'm trying to be present for just the very best stuff. So I kind of like wrote those off and I, I came back. I came out for a GFAI like I had GFAI on that first day when it was at like five dollars um, or wow. maybe five fifty. And I had it through the next morning and sold it at like 11 or 12 into the morning spike, which was, you know, in hindsight, not the best sell. Um, and I don't think I had a ton of size behind that one, like maybe four or 5,000 shares, but still it was like a nice trade on that. And uh, then I kind of was kicking myself um, a week or two later when GFI, when GFAI broke out. Um, I, I did buy that breakout. I, um, I started scooping up a bunch of low float ones again, just kind of in anticipation because I'm figuring, you know, all these chat rooms are going to start hitting low float AI stocks. And uh, CXAI, um, I had tried it back around the time GFAI had its first run and it never really got any volume, never got anything going. I think I think I was out of that for about break even. And then the morning that it, the, the day it went two to, what, two to nine it looks like, 
um, I bought that pre-market because pre-market it had more volume than I think it had had any other day. And, you know, I love the daily chart, the limited history, the kind of lack of volume on it. Mm. Um, and so I, I was buying dips pre-market and, you know, texting one of my trader friends um, as it's having its morning spike being like, I'm making the exact same mistake as I made a GFAI here, but I'm selling it. And I sold it like in the threes. <laughs> like it was, you know, like, I, I had more size behind that one at least, but still like that was really frustrating for me that like, I'm still not that great at holding on to these things. Cause like, you know, that emotional side of trading still does kick in for me a bit where it's like, you know, the thing is up from 150 to three in a couple of hours. And I'm starting to think about like, oh, I'm going to be so pissed if this like reverses and I give back a bunch of my gains. And like, I never even really let it have any kind of like trend break or any kind of, um, wow. you know, negative move. Yeah. Like I, I was I like, it, look, that, that, that's scary bullish chart you've ever seen, like in terms yeah. of a long, like it never even really cracked below VWAP during uh, regular market hours. So, uh, yeah, like I, I, I've got a ways to go on my, uh, you know, holding these things. Um, I, I also had INPX, I think, on this day going into the next one, whatever day it gapped up over a dollar. And I sold, I sold that one too late. Um, I, yeah, INPX, I bought this one after the dip and the hold and uh, took it all into this morning and got out. I kind of had to chase the weakness down into the uh, low ones, unfortunately. It was really bad sells on that one. And it was like, it was like, this one actually had dilution. It was, it was, it was sloppy. Like, I mean, I, I made out really well on my AI longs, but at the same time, like it was really poor execution and a lot of room to improve. Um, so it's, it's kind of like, you know, you know, as a trader, there's always mixed emotions, right? You know, like there's some things you can say, Hey, I did that really well. And there's always some things where it's like, Hey, I could definitely improve at that. Do you, it's funny. No, sorry, James, go for it. I was just gonna say it's funny hearing you like almost excited about the longs when I just know you as such like a short seller, and I think it's like right. it's he's like the whole time I'm just like, who is this guy? Person? I thought we were interviewing know, Tim right? and Johnny. I'm like, what is happening right now? <laughs> so did you you didn't get involved on the short side at all or in any of the AI? I sectors? did. I'm I'm honestly like I feel like I'm too out of practice at this point partially. Oh, um, yep. Yeah. So let me, one thing for some context here, part of what happened with the short selling um, is that when we went live with all these short selling algos um, through the DAS terminals, um, it was it was a situation where it was like, I can't be logged in in both places. So if I tried to like log in and trade personally, then it would kick my algos off or my algos would just like kick me off every like 20 seconds when they make sure they're connected or something like that. And then later I found out from the brokers, it's like, no, we can just make you a second username. And like, then you, both usernames can be connected to the same account. So like, this doesn't even have to be an issue. Um, but I, I, I don't know, like, like I said, I just, I was getting too stressed out by shorting and I wanted to be like stress-free as much as possible. So um, I let myself get way out of practice with my shorts. And now it's uh, not a huge part of what I do when I do briefly show up to place trades. And uh, I, I do miss it a bit because definitely there's a lot of missed opportunity there on the short side. Would you okay. say that uh, you're mostly doing like breakouts a lot on the long, stuff like that? Yeah, um, I'm definitely still looking a lot for like the big picture multi-day breakout type situation. Um, you know, a an intraday piece to it that I've kind of added for like looking for ads is um, it seems like there's a ton of fake breakdowns these yeah. days. Like where it's like there's like a support crack like right around VWAP where it cracks under VWAP and then somehow, you know, you would expect to see a waterfall down and instead it holds itself and just perks right back up. Like I, I love using situations like that to add to a position and then just using whatever that little crack low was as my new uh, risk level. Um, so I, I mainly am just looking for situations like that where the daily chart I think is like really primed to possibly go. There's not much of a float to it. And uh, the intraday is doing sneaky, trappy shit. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no. That's tough. It's funny. Do you think this strategy of like, because you, like, again, I've known you as such a short bias guy, you know, is this strategy of you learning to do breakouts, is this something that you think a lot of other traders can replicate? Or was it something that like really took you a long time to, to even kind of have the, the stomach to try it after coming from shorting? Right. Um, I mean, I was, I was like, one of the first strategies I ever got good at was OTC breakouts, unlike the scammy OTC pump and dumps. 
So like multi-day breakout, like has always kind of been like a big piece of what I did um, with listed stocks. I mean, of course it was tougher and a lot choppier, um, but I, I did build some comfort in that, like back when I was still doing a lot of active trading on my own. Um, so it's really not like that new of a thing to me. Um, if, if there's like the, the newest part maybe is just like trying to like judge, like, where is there a fake breakdown and how do I like, you know, add into that and like, you know, like GFAI, great example right there. Yep. You're pointing right at it. Um, where that, that looks like it could sucker in some shorts or scare out some longs or whatever. And then somehow it just catches and continues. But, um, yeah, like I, I, I don't have much fear at all with longs. Like it's very easy and very comfortable for me because I know my stops and I know what I'm going to lose if that stop gets hit. And, you know, I, I factor some slippage in of course, but, um, I, I'm very rarely surprised you know, by how much money I lose when a long trade goes wrong. So uh, it, it's it's very easy for me. And as far as whether other traders can do that, like long or short, I, I think I think the risk first mentality is just the way to go. And that can make trading much less emotionally draining. You know, if you if you kind of know your worst case scenario, as long as you actually stick to your stops and take the trade off. I know uh, one question that like definitely a lot of traders when they're watching this will definitely uh, comment or ask, and that's going to be, do you, would you rather anticipate these sector plays or would you uh, kind of wait for the volume to come in? Like, so a lot of the time, like the volume will kind of come in, we'll get over that breakout level mm -hmm. and we'll run intraday, but also sometimes uh, you'll wake up and it's already blasted in pre-market and you've already kind of missed the entry, you know, and it's already fading back down to that kind of level. So would you recommend people uh, anticipate a little bit or would you recommend people uh, just kind of be patient and wait for that kind of intraday setup to kind of come? Yeah, that's that's a good question. Um, I mean, it, it was it was a mix of both for me this last time um, where, you know, there were there were some anticipation plays I tried and you know, that was maybe 50, 50, whether it worked or not. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and then, yeah, there were the ones where it was more like it had blasted already like CXAI pre-market that day. And I was having to buy a dip and kind of like, you know, anticipate that it wasn't over yet. Um, I think that, gosh, I, I, it might just come down to personality type, like which one is easier for you. Um, mm -hmm. I, I feel like I personally feel a little more fear in the ones that have already run a bit and are having a pullback because at this point, like now they're already trading a lot of volume and there already are people you could say, Oh man, they're bagged. And like, it might be hard for this thing to come back and break to new highs. Uh, the anticipation trades, the biggest hurdle is liquidity because like, I don't want, I don't want to anticipate on something that is trading a lot of volume already. And I feel like I'm chasing, like, you know, the idea is kind of like try to start accumulating something that's pretty low float before it's really started to show any activity. And what I like about those is that, you know, if there's not been a lot of chasing already, if there's not been a lot of volume already, well, if the sector comes and goes and uh, it never really takes off for whatever reason, like there's not a lot of people to panic out. Like nothing's really going to like tank that stock on you as long as you're OK with your selection and you didn't grab something super dilutive or anything like that. So uh, so I did have a few like that where it was like, OK, I, I grabbed like 50,000 shares of this liquid stock and then it's not really working and how do i get out of this mm -hmm. and uh i found like you know breaking up my orders into like little you know 500 to 1000 share pieces and just like taking off like you know like 50 little trades like you know e-trade doesn't charge you per trade or anything like that it's free trades so you're not like eating commissions or anything like that so i'm kind of like you know tiptoeing in with tiny little orders and tiptoeing out with tiny little orders and trying not to like get too noticed because like if I, if I put a 50,000 share sell in all at once, like, yeah, the market's going to move. I'm not going to fill Jack, but um, you know, you, you fire through little thousand share market orders. Like you, you feel like that. <laughs> yeah. It's, that's definitely one thing that I've been working on as far as my own trading, trying to find that balance between like anticipating and also uh, you know, you see that volume come in intraday and you're like, okay, this is it. This is exactly the confirmation that I'm looking for. So yeah, that's definitely something uh, that I've definitely been working on. So even for me, that answers kind of some questions for me as far as kind of like what you do too. So that's kind of cool. And then Harry buys it and they dump it. I know. <laughs> <over>. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. That's In other news though, what the is happening to GFAI? What have oh, I missed offering. today? Yeah, I haven't looked at that in a few days. Wow, that's crazy. What, Alex, what did they do? They had an offering today. Oh, okay. that's awesome. 
That's horrid. <laughs> oh, man. I was That's just crazy. petering. I was petering uh, through these charts, and I was like, why is the bid so much low? Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> they had an offering today, a proposed oh. offering. Um, Jim, did, you catch any gonna... those? did you catch any of that sector bit? Sorry, what was that? The Chinese stuff that's happening today. Oh, yeah, I, I've been watching that a little bit. Like, so when I, when it comes to like the whole like playing sectors thing for me, um, I like to more focus on the sectors like where there's some kind of legitimate news behind them. You know, like AI. You know, you've got all the Chat GPT stuff going on. Like, uh, the last sector I really participated hard in was the oil stocks back last March when the Russia Ukraine war started. Um, like, you know, I, I like there to be like a decent fundamental reason behind the sector as well. Like with the Chinese stuff, it's just like, OK, these are all scammy companies and everybody knows it. So let's chase them. Um, so it's like I don't really get as, as involved in that. Like I, I was definitely watching top after hours uh, on Friday or whatever day it was and pretty amazed at its action. Um, and I, I did actually consider trading a few of them Monday morning because we saw all these sympathy ones gapping up. Um, and so like, I, I think the plan going into Monday for me was like, okay, let's look like, I, I kind of assumed top was just going to fall apart Monday. It actually did way more than I expected. Um, but I, I was thinking like, okay, if top is collapsing on Monday, let's have a watch list of other known scammy Chinese tickers and see if there's any that, you know, gap up and are holding up decently midday. And, uh, the only one I can remember that really did that and made a big move was, uh, HUDI, um, my my algo was actually short that um, around 4:15 I think um, from its quick morning spike, and then it uh, it covered it right at the 4:50 break. So I was I was pretty pleased at that uh, quick cover. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, but then hindsight, I was kind of like, hey, why didn't I like why why did I stop watching this? Why didn't I buy this? But it's uh, <laughs> you know that that's okay. Like the the China stuff is a little scary for even me. Yeah, for sure. That's funny. It's for you now, like everyone knows when you're shorting, um, like the sector plays is like a lot of times, like people are taking losses on the way up. Um, mm -hmm. and it's just a very difficult thing to, to time the top. And I know in the past, that's something you used to do. Do you prefer this kind of method now? I know you're, you're longing now, but is this something like, do you ever miss kind of that, the collapse day and like taking advantage of that side? Or is that something that you've just completely pushed out of your system now? Um, no, I wouldn't say it's completely pushed out of my system. I mean, that, that kind of is like, like, you know, I said, I totally redesigned the short algos. Um, and that's what their ultimate purpose is going to be is being there for collapse day. Um, and that, that's going to be their style too, is they're going to take their paper cuts on the way up, you know, um, lose, lose an R here and an R there, but you know, hopefully when it nails it, it's, you know, plus five or plus 10 or something like that. Um, so, so yeah, I'm just trying to automate that because, uh, especially knowing that like it will stop itself out no matter what, like it, it's going to hit like the offer if high day breaks. Like I, I think that I like knowing that I can't personally get stubborn. Um, it's out of my hands. Uh, so I, I think I'll get my fix that way. Um, but yeah, it can be, it can be a little hard to see some of these things tank and just be like, I used to be involved in that. Like I, I used to be, I used to be adding on that pop and uh, covering this washout. Ah. On a lot of these, uh, on a lot of these uh, breakout plays, how big is filings? Like how big does that come into play? Like if you see a breakout at like three bucks and they have warrants at like, let's say four bucks, would you, would you like automatically think like, okay, they might try and break it out over this level, get to these warrants or like, Maybe they have like baby shelf rule and they like want to run it to this price in order to get out of that. Uh, how much does like your tinfoil hat come on when you're when you're longing? Oh, yeah. The, the tinfoil hat's always on. I'm, I'm always <laughs> thinking about that stuff. Um, I, I will play those differently. I will be more conservative for sure. Um, I'm very I'm very paranoid. I have been caught in more than enough offerings. Like I, I just don't want to put myself in that position as much as I can. So uh, yeah, like I will, I will not take serious size on something where it's like, oh, they've got an S3 that could go effective any minute or uh, something like that. Um, or, you know, if, if there are levels with warrants, I'll probably be a seller into one of those levels. Um, mm. In a lot of cases, I just avoid those though. Like I'm just looking for the cleanest ones where there's like very little going on. Uh, the, the ones that maybe catch my attention um, where I might make exceptions is, um, 
like I'm trying to think of a good example, like maybe back uh, last March, CEI, like everyone knows how horrifyingly dilutive CEI is. And uh, that thing was just putting in like day after day after day of like 40, 50, 60 million shares of volume and kind of just like slowly building this multi-day chart. And uh, it eventually did have some kind of breakout and big move. And I think I participated in that one. Um, mm. let's see, it, what it, yeah, I think it had been like February and March, 2022. But, um, but yeah, like things like that, where it's like, there's just sustained really high volume and the stock is not falling apart despite the dilution that everyone knows is there. Um, then my tinfoil hat, you know, comes on even a little bit more and it's like, oh, they're trapping shorts. And, uh, then I'll probably let myself get involved. And I like to get involved with ones like that anyway, because the liquidity is there. Like, it's really not that hard to take size when the liquidity is there. Yeah, BBA uh, or sorry, uh, Bed Bath and Beyond is another one that uh, mm -hmm. that had that type of chart where like we just kept getting that volume day after day after day, and that one just you know before they went bankrupt, before they did that whole offering and stuff like that, that one was also one similar definitely to CEI, where that yeah, one had you, that volume. you were asking about um, if there's any like times I like miss shorting. Like this is the one, like I, I am very upset with myself for not making an exception and shorting this after they put out that filing with that awful dilution um, a few months yeah. ago. Like, I, I don't know what I was thinking, but like that was as much of a layup as you get. So uh, I, I think I'm going to have to adjust a little bit to um, maybe keep it half an eye out for another one like this. I'm um, back to the dark side. We're waiting. I was, I was getting really excited when they were ramping it up towards like 50 cents the other day. I, yeah. I was, I had that on my screen and I was like, I'm me too. Show. I was also watching that. Yeah, I was, I was getting ready. And, and they had a meeting coming up in a couple of weeks for like discussing a uh, reverse split and everything. And I, I was, I was like gearing up. I was getting ready to put in a huge short on that. And then uh, yeah. they ruined it with all the bankruptcy news. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's got to be. It's got to be hard bouncing back and forth, especially, you know, if like you're waiting, like you say, you really want to only come out for the best setups. And it's like, I feel like you could easily get suckered back into like, almost trading daily. If you're like, oh, well, got to make an exception for this one now. And then I got to make an exception yeah. for that one. I, I did that. I did that um, more um, a couple of years ago, I'd say. And yeah. uh, it, it was actually after the um, after the oil sector. I kind of got myself um, a little bit addicted back into it again, where it was like, okay, that oil sector went really well. Let's let's keep this going. And then I uh, traded really sloppy for a few weeks and was like, okay, that's enough of that, where uh, it just was too much back and forth and I was not making effective decisions. So uh, that kind of, you know, it's kind of one of those things like you get burned and then you learn your lesson. Makes sense. It really is. Tim, I have a it's question impressive. about, I have a yeah, question about stress how do you do you mentioned how shorting becomes stressful from time to time long can be stressful too if you get caught an offering but my question is how do you deal with stress how do you release stress and do you have any advice for people that may be stressed in their trading what they could do to kind of release some of that tension yeah um, i mean the big one for me back in the day especially was uh just like finding time to go to the gym and work out like uh or, or like beach walks, like a big one for me after my son was born and I was in Puerto Rico was, uh, you know, I'd be like end of a trading day, I'd be like totally fried and stressed out. And uh, then I'd like pop him in this baby carrier and just like walk the beach with him for like 30 to 45 minutes. Like that was awesome. Like just getting out and moving around. Uh, I, I think that there's also a discipline component of that too. Like, you know, a lot of us don't really want to work out. And so when you're overcoming that and forcing yourself to go and do it, that can kind of translate into trading a little bit almost where it's like, okay, you're, you're exercising discipline in another area of your life. So now it makes it a little easier to exercise discipline in front of the trading screen. Um, so yeah, just getting, getting active, I think was like one of the most effective things I ever had for stress management. Makes sense. I like that. Do you, I mean, I think that it's pretty obvious now that the market has completely changed, you know, since you started, you know, since trading, mm -hmm. we're talking small caps and everything has completely evolved. Do you think that one now it's hard, it's more difficult now more than ever to get into trading? Um, and if so, do you have any sort of advice that you would give to someone interested in pursuing trading uh, kind of in the current market? Yeah. Um, I mean, is it more difficult to get into it? 
In some ways, yeah. Like I feel like some of the patterns are a lot less clean than they used to be. Um, I mean, I know one of my favorites used to be like overextended gap down, and now it seems like that setup is just like dead. Um, like, you know, now, now the, today's version of overextended gap down is like the stock closes at its highs and gaps down 30%. And it's like, how do I play yeah. this? <laughs> um, so, I mean, stuff like that going away definitely makes things a little more challenging. But at the same time, I feel like there's more volatility than ever. And uh, volatility is really where the real opportunity comes from. And then it's just figuring out ways to take advantage of it. So, I mean, the advice for anybody starting out, I mean, I, I think it's a lot of a lot of similar stuff to like, you know, when any of us would have started out where it's like, you know, you've really got to take your time, keep your size under control, know you're going to make mistakes. You're probably going to have a blow up or two and just not letting that take you out of the game and be like irreparable damage because those are some of the best lessons um, and meticulous, meticulous tracking. Like I've always been all about that and I always will be all about that. Like it doesn't matter, you know, what variation of the setup is showing itself from year to year. Like, you know, try to try to stay on top of it with data and figure out like, you know, just whatever you can to try to figure out how to take advantage of certain moves, you know, figure out what areas interest you, fit your personality, and then just get to work. Do you, so, uh, oh, do you think that uh, um, with like the rise of chat GBT, with like the rise of AI, obviously it's way quicker to study and to learn. Like, Compared to like a couple years ago, the learning curve has been accelerated like crazy. You know, I can go in mm -hmm. to chat GPT and ask it all type of questions about the filings. I can go in and ask it questions about a lot of trading things and it will spit me out the answers right away. So do you think with the more information that's coming into play uh, that things could potentially change and like patterns could stop working? Or do you think with like, like, do you think like there's going to be less opportunity because of the access in like to information or do you think uh, it's just going to stay the same and like nothing really to worry about? I, I think it goes along with like patterns evolving. Um, I, I think that things will probably get a little more difficult in that sense, just that like we'll have to kind of adjust our expectations. Like, um, you know, we already talked about overextended breakdowns, but like multi-day breakouts, like Aside from when there's like a big sector running, it seems like a whole lot of those stuff now compared to like it used to be yeah. a much higher success rate. So something like that as well. Like I, I think it'll just come down to selectivity. Like I think a lot of the extreme scenarios that we all profit off of are never really going to go away. You know, like you get a bunch of shorts trapped in a play, like that's going to have some kind of blow off -ish. And there's going to be, you know, maybe an opportunity to get long that if you can recognize it or an opportunity to get short that once it's on the backside. So it's, um, you know, it, it probably comes more down to selectivity than anything. And like just conditioning yourself to be a little more patient for the most extreme and uh, potentially profitable situations. Uh, but it will be interesting to see how things change with, you know, the increase in um, automation and AI and all that. Like it's, yeah. it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a journey. So a lot of stock traders you know novice people newbies that are coming into the market you know they they've got varying goals backgrounds anything like that some may have large amounts of savings some may have small amounts of savings and they they a lot of people that come into this they look to day trading as like a solution to their financial challenges so for those folks what do you think that what measures could new traders, regardless of whatever their motivations are, what what do you think they could implement to protect themselves in the unpredictable world of trading? Man. Um, the million dollar question. Yeah, that's, that's hard just because, I mean, I, I know that when I started, I probably didn't have my head in the right place. And it was like, let's get rich quick and let's do, let, let's rush this process and, uh, like I was trying to like follow trading alerts, you know, like I, I was doing everything wrong from the start because like, that's just what I wanted trading to be like a way to quickly boost my bank account. And uh, I mean, we, all we can really do, I feel like is just like keep repeating the same warnings over and over. Like you've got to trade small. You've got to like expect things to be much harder than you think they're going to be. Um, other than, other than just saying that and hoping people listen, I don't know what you can do because like, I, I, you know, I've, for, for years I've said 
that same message over and over and I'll still get messages where it's like, Hey, do you think I should do credit card debt to fund my trading account? Like, <laughs> no, don't <laughs> like, <laughs> like people are going to do what they're going to do, but man, I hope they listen. Cause it, it just also makes trading so much easier if you're not doing it from a position of like, I have to make money today. Yeah. Like if, if you can actually come to the market and just say, Hey, I'm going to see what presents itself and I'm going to try to trade it as best I can. Like you're going to be such, you're going to be so much more effective as a trader than if you're pushing and trying to make things happen. And it doesn't matter why you're pushing. Like I'll, I'll show up on a day where I say, Hey, I want to trade and I'll try to push and make things happen. Cause I want to feel like it was worth it to like step away and be in front of the screen and I'll have a crappy day. Like even now, like, you know, you, you've got to put yourself in front of the market with the right mindset. Yeah. Well, everyone knows you as, you know, the, the icon of short selling that came out of that age, but a lot of people don't know that, you know, you're just a regular guy that's just really <laughs> damn good at trading stocks. <laughs> and so what I'd like to do is I'd like to finish up with just a lightning round of questions here for you. Just regular guy questions, right? Okay. Completely unrelated to trading. So just be ready. Here you go. Okay. okay. All right. Well, so what was your first, first job? Question. What was my first job? Yeah. Uh, my first job was I was at a Barnes and Noble and uh, I basically worked the Starbucks counter in the Barnes and Noble uh, for maybe 75% of my time there. So the secret <laughs> to being a successful trader is Starbucks. being a barista? What the? I worked the Starbucks too. <laughs> what, Alex? Come on now. <laughs> That's crazy. All right. What's, uh, what's your favorite go-to meal? You get one, it's your last day on earth. You get one meal to finish off. What is it going to be? Uh, I'm on, I'm on a ramen kick right now. So it's been, I'm having ramen like three, four times a week. So it's probably yeah. a big bowl of ramen. What's your like favorite? Good ramen. ramen. Not, not, not instant ramen. ramen. Oh, okay. Good, like, <laughs> line ramen. I was like, damn, the AI law, <laughs> the AI algo is tough. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> What's your favorite hobby outside of trading? Um, probably right now bowling. I I did a league, my, my first league in like four years. Um, oh, that's awesome. hell yeah, man! And now I'm I'm really getting into it again, and I'm like, man, I want to beat my brother because he's a year younger than me, and he's always been a better bowler. I can't handle that. <laughs> Terrible. What book are you currently reading? Uh, I'm not currently reading any books. All right. Favorite non-financial podcast or TV show? What do you listen to or watch the most? Um, I, I really enjoyed Severance. I was, I was big on season one of Severance. Dude, um, that show is wild. That yeah, I know, wild. right? Dude, I, I still can't figure out what's happening. Mm -hmm. like, and, uh, I'm, I'm loving Succession right now. I don't know if that counts as non-financial, but. I think it is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sad that's ending, but. Did show. you ever watch Billions? Yeah, Billions. I've been, yeah, that's, uh. Last season of that's coming out later this year. Yep. Yeah. Paul uh, Damian Lewis is back too. It's Bobby. Oh, good news. Nice. Yeah, but I'm excited yeah. about. What is your most memorable trading mistake, and what did you learn from it? Oh man, it might have been that Kodak uh, thinking I was totally covered and I wasn't. Um, if it's if it's not that, then it's the two hundred ninety thousand dollar lake loss where uh, it was just you know short failed to stop out add 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 and then just like blow out cover because i was too scared Ooh. and the lesson the lesson there um it took it took a few more losses like that to learn the lesson but the lesson was if the stock is beyond my stop loss point and i'm still in it for some reason never ever add under any circumstance most memorable vacation you've ever taken oh um i think going to Florida for the first Falcon heavy launch. That was, uh, wow. that was really cool. I enjoyed that a lot. If you weren't a trader, what would you have done? Oh, I don't know. I think about that a lot. <laughs> I, so after Barnes and Noble, I was at state farm for a while. I, I like worked summers full time at state farm and I didn't, I was not a great college student. Like I didn't really have any internships or anything lined up. Um, I was a finance major. I had no idea what I was going to do with it. So I think I probably would have slid back into that state farm role and just kind of gotten trapped at state farm. Ooh, sounds awesome. Yeah. I got one, one, one last question. Do you think you'll be trading stocks for the rest of your life? Uh, in some capacity. Yeah. I think I'll always show up for the big stuff at least. 
Like I, I don't know if I would have thought I would have like retired to this extent already. Um, just because like, I mean, the, the kids have been in daycare for like a year now. Like I do have mornings free again. I just am like not really using them. Like I'm kind of enjoying the detachment and not having to show up every day to trade. So I'm, I'm sure I'll always be somewhat involved in the markets, but I don't know if I'll ever be back to like totally full time. And if you could have dinner, last question, if you could have dinner with any historical figure, who would it be and why? Oh my gosh, you're gonna stump me with that one. I have no idea. <laughs> I, I'm not a big history guy. I don't think much about the past. So I don't. Anyone I don't you look up to. to? Anyone? We look up to. That's a tough one, too. I don't know. Who do I look up to? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Harry Haas. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> that's a tough one. That's, that's a stumper. We gotta work on that. That's one to think about. That's that's rapid cool. maybe, maybe I'll tweet an answer on that one. I need to think about that a little bit. There you go. I, I feel like I'm unreasonably stumped for that question, but like it's just, <laughs> you should have something, but like it's just not. I should have something, but I don't, and I don't. I'm Do you I'm see sorry to everybody. any up and coming talent on like social media, Twitter, whatever? Like up and coming traders that you've been kind of monitoring or looking at, or you think have like potential? Um, there's. There's a couple quant guys that like I kind of follow where they uh, like I, I know they're doing that whole algo thing also and lots of really heavy back testing. Um, I'm trying to think of their Twitter handles now. Um, one is I think like uh, I think he's a teenager still, uh, maybe Xander sure. is his name or something like that. Wow. And uh, he looked like he was having some really good results for a while. And then uh, day trading zoo, I think that's another one. Yep. And it seems like he's, uh, you know, he's he's very intelligent on the quant side of things, and he's got his account at all time highs. I think so. You know, guys like that, I'm interested to see how they do because I think they're data guys with like a lot better of a data background than me. So it's always exciting to kind of see what's possible for people like that because I know they can take it so much further than I can. Cool. So what's one thing on your bucket list that you haven't accomplished yet that you want to? I I want to do one of those. Um, like SpaceX or Blue Origin, like civilian flights, like Ooh. down the road, whenever whenever those are a little more available. Um, You're talking right up Alex's alley right now. <laughs> yeah. All right, I got 500000 in a spe separate bank account waiting for them to bring me on. <laughs> waiting for it. Yeah, I, I don't know if I want to do the trip all the way to Mars. Like I think six months on a rocket might like freak me out. <laughs> um, but yeah, like one of, the, one of the little civilian flights. We'll start there and see how it goes. Awesome, man. Well, thanks so much for being here, dude. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, thanks again, guys. Oh, this is awesome. Thanks.